Good morning. Uh, my name is Sarah Bunn, and I manage workforce housing and engagement for Minnesota Housing's uh, Multifamily Division. Welcome to the 2023 Multifamily Consolidated Request for Proposals kickoff event. This will be a two-part virtual event. On day one, which was yesterday, we provided an introduction to Minnesota Housing and the Consolidated RFP 101. Today, which is day two, we will focus on updates and new information for the multifamily consolidated RFP. You will hear from multifamily staff on topics that are either new this year or areas we want to emphasize as you start to consider multifamily proposals and applications for the 2023-2024 HTC Round 1 RFP. This is the first year of a two-year QAP, so we do have changes to go over. And once again, we were able to get the RFP published prior to this event, so we will also be going over changes to forms and documents. Please use this time to ask specific questions on RFP materials or checklist items. We will also touch on changes to submission requirements for supportive housing projects, preservation updates, and funding sources. Today's presentation will run until approximately 11.25 at which time we will conduct a group questionnaire and, or excuse me, a group question and answer session. This session is intended to uh, be for participants to ask questions on any of the uh, presented topics or materials. Uh, we will also post this um, webinar uh, recorded version of it live um, on the website following the kickoff. Um, a survey will be sent out at a later date requesting feedback on your experience today and um, thank you in advance for providing uh, feedback so that we may continue to make the um, kickoff uh, structured responsibly. So thank you for those external partners attending virtually with us today. I also want to extend appreciation to the Minnesota housing team who have prepared today's content uh, to be able to engage with you as we start the technical assistance season and you work to develop your projects. Next slide, please. Due to time constraints, questions will not be answered until the end of the entire presentation, at which time there will be a group question and answer session. So you can either um, type your questions into the questions section or chat box of the GoToWebinar toolbar at any time, or you can wait and um, raise your hand and ask questions during the Q&A session at the end. Next slide, please. We do encourage you to request technical assistance using our technical assistance request form. Um, we will discuss this further uh, later in the presentation. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide and the next one is an overview of today's agenda, uh, which is also on your handout that you received when you registered for the webinar. Next slide, please. And again, this is the rest of the day two agenda. I would now like to introduce Minnesota's Housings Commissioner, Jennifer Ho. I know she's right in the process of getting online here, rushing from another event. I'm wondering Do if that square popping on is her. Oh, one one moment. It says uh, that she, uh, she texted me that she is in listen only mode. Whoever is running the meeting, if they can adjust her. One second, everyone. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Am I here? You are here, Jennifer. Welcome. <laughs> I've never had such a hard time knowing whether or not I've arrived. I know. Um, well, I just uh, uh, thanks everybody. I, I know there's a lot of people that are participating uh, in this conversation today. Uh, partnership, partnership, partnership. Uh, that is what this work is all about. And I um, just want to recognize uh, city and county staff, community partners. We've got for profits, we've got nonprofit developers, uh, some tribal communities. Uh, thank you all. Uh, for uh, the work that you do to uh, help getting uh, these projects uh, preserved or in the ground in the first place. 
one of the things I think that's uh, exciting about this round is uh, we've got a, a new qualified allocation plan. Uh, you know, always our goal is to help communities who have been most impacted by the uh, the, the quality or the, the lack of housing in their communities. And we've really been doing a lot of work to focus on uh, deep affordability, long-term affordability. Uh, very pleased uh, in our selections last year uh, that we are bringing uh, more uh, new partners, uh, partners who are new to us into the fold, uh, working with more uh, developers of color. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, I think the, the other area that we're just really interested in is the way that these projects can can contribute to a better climate um, and and better energy efficiency for the operators and, and the residents who live there. I am, um, uh, you know, we're really busy up at the Capitol right now. I am, um, it is so bizarre to have the April 19th and to already know that come May 22nd, the last day of session, that we're gonna end this with a billion dollars for housing. And um, I don't know exactly what that package of a billion looks like. I think we're gonna be off the house, house floor tonight uh, and off the Senate floor, and then we head into conference uh, committee discussions. But we know that, um, that there will be a significant investment, I believe, in the Economic Development and Housing Challenge Program. Uh, we think that there will be a big investment in, in housing infrastructure. You'll hear us now talking about housing infrastructure, bonds, and cash. Um, because with big surplus, we're looking at, at the possibility of doing that. And of course, um, uh, we're also doing work out in Congress uh, around the housing tax credit, trying to get the Housing Credit Improvement Act uh, passed. Uh, and then, of course, our tried and true HUD programs, home and the, the National Housing Trust Fund. So, so there's, you know, there's a lot of play. But I think the most important thing uh, for the development community to know is that usually, regrettably, you know, we need to say no uh, to more of you than we say yes to, largely because of a shortage of resources, not because of a shortage of good ideas and, and good hard work that you're doing out in the community. And I, and I believe in this selection round, uh, we're going to be able to say yes to a lot more. And I'm really excited about that. But that also means that we're asking you uh, to make sure that you give us high quality projects um, and, and help us help us say yes. I, um, I just want to give a special nod out to the State Public, uh, Public Housing Authority, uh, Met Council's Housing Redevelopment Authority. Uh, thanks for pairing um, some vouchers uh, into this RFP round. Uh, love those project-based vouchers. Um, that help us get units that are affordable uh, to people at the lowest income levels. And uh, of course, I just want to thank uh, my rock star team. I, um, I, uh, I have been so amazed at what this team has been able to accomplish, uh, even as uh, we have worked in this uh, uh, hybrid environment for over three years now. And, uh, you know, I, I watched them uh, help solve uh, a lot of gnarly problems. Uh, I've watched them adapt to what's happened in the development market around supply chain and, and cost pressures and, and other things like that. We have a commitment to getting there, uh, getting these deals done. And uh, I uh, have watched my team uh, time and time again, just uh, uh, value uh, being a good partner and trying to figure out how to get to yes, even though uh, we, we get dealt some gnarly problems sometimes. So uh, uh, this is gonna be a fun year. Um, uh, thank you again for your partnership. Thanks for your interest in this work. And I will toss it over to my more than able and usually pretty witty Assistant Commissioner James Lenhoff. Thank you, Jennifer, and thanks for joining us for this brief time today. We know you've been busy advocating at the Capitol along with many of our partners for those dollar resources. I'll hold a lot of my uh, wit towards the end of the session today, so stick around all the way to the, uh, to the end where there's going to be a lot of great information today. And one thing I want to know with uh, Jennifer noting the billion dollars, so that billion dollars includes both capital resources and it includes a big boost for programs to help prevent and end homelessness through our housing stability team, which is also very exciting. 
The reason I want to note that now is because it doesn't mean that a billion dollars will be available to Minnesota Housing to build projects on May 22nd, and in fact, that's over a two-year time period. What it does mean, and want to emphasize what Jennifer referenced, was the ability to select more projects with all of you. And I am extremely proud of the team at Minnesota Housing and the work that we're doing. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that uh, at the end today as part of my closing remarks. But also with all of our partners uh, that are out there, we have adapted internally, but we also know that the last three years has required a lot of adaptation from the development partners, local communities, supportive service providers, and so many more. Uh, it, it, it's been hard for everyone. And we are looking for ways to be able to do more projects and hopefully find some ways to make at least parts of it easier, including some changes that will get talked about later from the consolidated RFP process, uh, particularly related to some supportive housing related work. So thank you for sharing your time with us today. It really does make a difference, us coming together, being able to share this information. If we're not able to get to everyone's questions today, please do uh, still share the question with us. We want to get the information out there. We know it can be a lot to take in in a short period of time. Uh, and I look forward to the next uh, couple hours of information sharing and questions, and I will join you all at the end uh, with some other closing remarks. Thank you. Great. Thank you, James and Commissioner Ho, for your welcoming remarks and providing a legislative update. Uh, it is indeed an exciting time for affordable housing the industry uh, in Minnesota. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Summer Jefferson. I am the manager for the programs team in multifamily. Our team oversees the multifamily consolidated RFP process in a number of the state and federal programs that are included in the RFP, including housing tax credits and housing infrastructure bonds. We are pleased to be able to hold this event with you again this year. Uh, the multifamily consolidated RFP is uniquely uh, a Minnesotan. Um, it is uniquely um, Minnesotan. Uh, it has been around for decades, but it is certainly grown and changed over time as the resources, the economy, uh, and the market has changed across the state. Uh, so this time of year is definitely an exciting time for the agency, as it is a milestone to kind of mark the initial culmination of a lot of great work. A lot of coordination with all of you. Uh, it makes funding available to help build and preserve homes that are affordable to communities throughout the state. Uh, I also want to take this opportunity to take the entire multifamily team for all of the work that they've done up to this point. Uh, and again, want to thank you all for joining us and sharing your time with us today. We appreciate your continued participation and your partnership in the industry and in this process. So as, as Sarah mentioned, the last couple of years, we have changed the configuration of the kickoff into two different days, and that's um, based upon your feedback. So our strategy has been to break out some of the details in the content into separate webinars um, and training opportunities. Day one is kind of focused on newer or emerging applicants and we offer a more detailed introduction to the multifamily, the process, the consolidated RFP. We cover, that includes some of our processes, our programs, and our policies. So most of the content-heavy RFP training that we used to see in this day has already been covered in that day one session. I believe it is also already available online, the recorded, so it's on demand and available for anyone who's interested in, in uh, looking at that, reviewing that. We covered an introduction to the RFP, housing tax credits 101, housing infrastructure bonds in more detail, our underwriting standards, um, and also really dug into the, some of the supportive housing changes that Vicki will briefly mention today. Um, we also are offering a number of other uh, uh, separate trainings and tutorials that you will seek upcoming. So please take a look at our website. Registration is open. Um, that also includes a, a scoring. As Jennifer mentioned, we have a new qualified allocation plan. So we'll cover some of those modifications to the scoring a little bit today, but in more detail in that separate training. So our focus today is to emphasize what has changed, um, what has been updated, and what is new. Essentially, what are the most relevant items that we think you should keep in mind? Our intent is to provide you with the most pertinent information that you that will help you as you 
start to develop your applications. Um, and with that, I guess we'd like to start with just a brief overview of the RFP. My colleague Q Vang and I uh, will walk through uh, some of the general information. We'll highlight the most important upcoming dates and then cover a few updates and improvements that we've uh, for this uh, RFP. Next slide. Uh, the Multifamily Consolidated RFP is Minnesota Housing's largest competitive request for proposal. It is offered once a year uh, and, which, and provides a means of one-stop shopping by consolidating and coordinating multiple multifamily housing funding resources into one application process. Uh, it is the Multifamilies Division annual uh, process where various entities or very, all of the applicants can submit an application requesting capital funding for multifamily affordable housing efforts throughout the state. Um, as I said before, it is a uniquely Minnesotan uh, RFP process uh, where it, it uh, has been around for a long period of time and, and, and it is uh, one of the key benefits of the actual consolidated RFP is a consistent application process which allows a streamlined application review process and a funding cycle that allows adequate planning uh, time at the community level. The process allows uh, Minnesota Housing to review all the applications at once and compare scoring, feasibility, and other review considerations across all of the submittals in order to maximize the number of projects that get funded on an annual basis, and then also, uh, which thus increases the number of the affordable, affordable housing units throughout the state. Next slide. So the multifamily consolidated RFP is the primary mechanism and process that the agency uses to award and allocate the federal and state, and state resources. Applicants requesting funding for a specific housing development or activities that meet a specific housing need and generally do not apply for specific programs. Um, the, the RFP deploys significant capital funds that include the federal and state programs. Uh, we also have deferred loan and project-based vouchers resources available from our, our public funding partners. Um, I just wanted to briefly share the funding sources available, currently available for the 2023 multifamily uh, RFP. Uh, we'll go in a bit more detail into each of these uh, programs later in the presentation. The federal programs listed here are available, the uh, will be available 9% low income housing tax credits, uh, HOME, National Housing Trust Fund, uh, and HUD Section 811 project based rental assistance. Next slide. The state appropriation and the bonding capital funding programs include Lemire, uh, Bridge Loans, uh, Economic Development and Housing Challenge uh, pro a Program, Flexible Financing for Capital Costs, Housing Infrastructure Bonds, and Preservation Affordable Rental Investment Fund, or PARA. So these funding sources, as uh, James and uh, uh, the commissioner mentioned, depend on the availability of the state and the federal resources. Uh, we are anticipating a big year this year, uh, but the final amounts of the state resources will not be known until after the conclusion of Minnesota's legislative uh, session. So those, any additional resources or preferences or requirements, including eligible uses, uh, may impact some of the guidance that we've already uh, incorporated or our processes. So if the guidance, um, if it is impacted or needs to be modified or update, we will do that um, and update the appropriate documents. And we generally will send out electronic alerts via our e-news uh, and update our, our web page accordingly to let you know uh, of those. Um, next slide. So Minnesota Housing also partners with public entities to provide additional resources uh, in this RFP, the Met Council and St. Paul Public Housing Authority have made available grants and project-based vouchers. Uh, Matt Council has made available 2.5 in LHIA grant, and St. Paul Public Housing Authority has made 125 project-based vouchers available. 
including an additional 25 uh, VASH public uh, uh, project-based vouchers. We appreciate their continued partnership. Um, they do have program staff that are on today, and they will go into more detail about the specific, uh, uh, the specific uh, information later on in the presentation. Next slide. So then looking at the different project types and activities, I just wanted to briefly just reference this. Uh, the four different project types that we see are, are in our RFP are workforce housing. So projects located in areas of job growth, preservation, projects that are uh, at risk of loss and preserve existing federal uh, assistance, permanent supportive housing, projects that serve homeless households or people with disabilities, and then senior housing uh, projects that are for seniors over the age of 55. Um, the multifamily RFP standards uh, is one of, is a guidance document on our website that has additional details about the eligible activities and the eligible financing activities. So uh, I would definitely take a closer look at that. It is very helpful information regarding the standards and the processes that we use during the RFP process. Next slide. So just one of the areas that we definitely receive the most questions on is how we make our selection decisions. So I wanted to spend a little bit more time today just kind of discussing our multifamily selection framework and principles. Uh, you may have um, we, we've you may have spent a fair amount of time gathering information about our scoring policies and our requirements. Um, the RFP is very competitive, so a project score does act, does matter but it isn't necessarily the only selection factor that the Minnesota Housing will use in order to select projects. Um, the multifamily RFP standards outlines uh, a lot of this information in, in detail. Um, and so several components are related to our selection process. These include, but are not limited to, uh, a review of the project compared to strategic and the selection priorities outlined in our qualified allocation plan and Minnesota Housing Strategic Plan. Uh, all the applications are scored according to the priorities can, that are uh, incorporated into the self-scoring worksheet and our scoring guide and then ranked based upon that score. Um, we also do a review of the projects for eligibility, including a review of the housing, the project type, the housing activity, uh, how the project actually aligns with the available resources for Minnesota Housing and our funding partners. Um, project feasibility is also something that we look at, which ranges from an analysis of the architectural schematics to the population served in relation to the market and the community, the needs of the actual community. Um, we also analyze the organizational and financial capacity uh, to determine if the project team can successfully close on and manage the project for the long term. Deferred loan funding priorities is something that we also uh, take a look at and analyze. Uh, this is a review of how the project compares to the different and various deferred funding uh, resources and priorities that we have. Um, each of the funding or the programs have their own set of um, uh, eligible requ of requirements statutory requirements uh, for tax credits requirements that are things that are required from the code and the qualified allocation plan. So we um, take a look at those, those different limitations, uh, the impact project type, uh, geographic location and distribution. Uh, there's also an additional uh, requirements such as preferences or set asides that we also have to take in consideration. Um, all of those different things dictate the type of funding that each of the projects can qualify for, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, finally, we also kind of do a review to make sure that the project is compatible with our underwriting standards and our design standards, and, and always keeping in consideration uh, the available funding that we have and, and, and trying to provide a geographic balance across the state based upon project type. Next slide. So this is kind of a, a visual representation of the multifamily selection framework and all the different considerations that I just kind of went through, uh, how the projects are reviewed, ranked, selected. I think it is a true representation of how we try to balance all of the different 
uh, the, all the different components, uh, the funding principles and the factors. Um, if you take a look at this uh, briefly, the, you know, the first, one of the first things to uh, look at the geographic balance, the agency really works to generally achieve geographic balance uh, for both between projects located in the metro and greater Minnesota within the metro to balance between projects in, in Minneapolis and St. Paul and the suburban communities, and then in greater Minnesota to fund projects in as many regions of the state as possible. Um, this balancing also takes into account the location of our previous awards. Um, the second is just actually the project score and the strategic priorities. So we look at utilizing the agency award, the type of point, the points that are awarded for each of the projects. We look at the application type, the financing structure. So submitting uh, a dual application uh, provides more opportunity for agency funding um, or can provide more opportunity for agency funding. Uh, we look at the project type. Um, and this is kind of the last the factor that is available for funds by project type. Um, you'll hear more about some of the resources that we anticipate having in, in this RFP. Um, but although, and, and we are very grateful that we have a large number of resources and this will be a big year. So, but although we do have a number of funding sources, as I mentioned, we are limited in what projects though that can be funded with those. So it is definitely a balance of trying to determine which projects um, are, will fit into the, the, the different funding sources. Um, so hopefully this sheds a little bit more light on some of the funding considerations and how we balance a variety of the different factors uh, when we're throughout the selection process. And with that, I will hand it over to Q uh, Bing, who will talk more about some of the RFP improvements and the updates. Hello, everyone. I am Q Vang, the Multifamily Consolidated RFP Manager. I would like to provide everyone with some tips as applicants are working through their application. Yesterday, or day one of the RFP kickoff event, I went into some general details on the steps to apply, including an overview of each policy and guidance document. So my first tip is to really understand the policy and guidance documents. I will not go over these again today and will refer you to the day one recording, which is in fact already on our website. Another plug I will provide is to really read and understand the RFP, the multifamily RFP standards, which is the overarching guidance document on how Minnesota housing will conduct the review and selection of the multifamily consolidated RFP applicants or applications. Included in the multifamily RFP standards are our application review and selection process that Summer just discussed and some best practices when submitting a dual application. Request technical assistance would be the next um, big tip. Our skilled underwriting staff will provide you with guidance on how to help make your application competitive. But of course, technical assistance from Minnesota Housing is only advisory and will not guarantee selection. Sign up for the multifamily customer portal access um, if you haven't already. Portal is our tool we use to facilitate the multifamily consolidated RFP and housing tax credit funding rounds. When you set up portal access, applicants will be able to let us know they, that they intend to apply, which is in fact required, um, they will be able to populate all checklists or application materials for their project and proposal type. And they will be able to submit their application. We will continue to use portal to communicate with projects post selection. I highly recommend requesting and obtaining access today if you have not already and start playing around in the system. Next slide please. Here is the general timeline for the multifamily consolidated RFP as it is fairly consistent each year. As you see in your screen, the agency releases some application materials late last month, including the pre-applications for HUD section 811 and the innovative construction techniques. Last week, we fully opened the multifamily consolidated RFP and housing tax credit round one for applications. 
portal is now open for all applicants to enter their project characteristics, submit their pre-application, submit their intent to apply, generate all application checklist items, and submit their application. Later this month, pre-applications for applicants who are interested will be due. As I mentioned earlier, the intent to apply is in fact required and will be due in May. The intent to apply, <clears throat> excuse me, lets us know that you are interested in applying and provides us with some preliminary characteristics and information about your project. There are no fees that will be due during the intent to apply. The full application is due in July, and those applications are submitted via portal. Between July through December is the evaluation period, and the final funding recommendations are submitted at board uh, at Minnesota Housing's December board meeting. Next slide, please. As I just mentioned, the evaluation period starts in July from the moment the application closes until our December board meeting. A friendly reminder, the Minnesota Housing does not communicate or permit clarification uh, specific to scoring after the application deadline. Minnesota Housing may communicate with applicants uh, related to the feasibility review of the project or for non-scoring application related items. And Minnesota Housing may provide um, an applicant with additional time to produce a required signature if completed or missing. Next slide, please. On this, on this slide, I do wanna call your attention to the few trainings that Summer just discussed, and we'll continue to remind people of these trainings um, that you may be interested in. The self-scoring worksheet training and the supportive housing technical assistance trainings. Both trainings are posted on our website, including our e-newses, and we uh, will be posting the series. Um, we also post, a, we also developed and posted a series of portal tutorials. Uh, next slide, please. Now I would like to go over some improvement efforts that we made just this year. Next slide, please. In recent years, the agency has made significant strides to streamline the multifamily consolidated RFP and its application materials. In 2020, the housing tax credit qualified allocation plan was shifted to be effective for two years. This year, to align with the QAP, we have also moved most of the multifamily consolidated RFP guidance documents, forms, and application materials to also be effective for two years. What does this mean? Um, applicants who submit an application for this 2023 multifamily consolidated RFP and who may not, and who may resubmit an application for the 2024 multifamily consolidated RFP may use the same application materials and forms. You will not need to go back and re-download all the forms and copy and paste all the information. As you see on your screen, I do want to be extremely clear that most of the application materials are now, bi are now biannual, not all application materials. The reason not all application materials have moved to a biannual is because some of our documents will need to be updated annually. The best way to determine if the application materials or forms is applicable for two years is in the body or the instruction section of each form. All documents will clearly state which and how many funding rounds the form or application material is applicable for. Along with moving most of our application materials to biennial, we removed application materials that were no longer relevant and combined and combined application materials and forms. One example of this, which uh, Vicki will be discussing or sharing a little bit later, is removing some of the supportive housing documentation. Next slide, please. Though last year's multifamily consolidated RFP feedback through last year's multifamily consolidated feedback survey, we heard many applicants that additional guidance on dual applications was needed. 
in this year's multifamily RFP standards, um, we added some additional information on how to submit dual applications. Workbooks, including if applicants were interested, <clears throat> including if applicants were interested in a third funding structure. Another area we received a lot of feedback on was around technology and the portal. Karen will be going over um, these areas and details momentarily, but for this year, we have created some portal tutorials that I just shared um, that were pre-recorded and available for your viewing. Lastly, we renamed all of the application checklist items or application materials to help applicants identify at a glance if the check checklist item or material is relevant to your project. Again, Karen will be highlighting this in the next few slides. Next slide, please. As I mentioned in the previous slide, Minnesota Housing relies heavily on applicants' feedback. We aim to be customer friendly and do our very best to try to make improvements, which will help streamline the application process. Once the multifamily consolidated RFP closes, we will send a survey. This is your opportunity to provide constructive feedback on application materials, portal, which is our online application tool, technical assistance, and your over and the overall multifamily consolidated RFP experience. Yes, we do read every comment. We analyze your responses and we look for opportunities to make improvements that you have suggested. Some items we may have to address in the next RFP or two. Otherwise, um, we do try to make every effort to um, take those recommendations into consideration. In the note sections, you may also want to add, um, and, and that is actually the end of my presentation. I'll go ahead and move it over to Karen. Good morning, I'm Karen Wilbright from our business operations team and I'm gonna provide a brief uh, highlight on some technology updates. Next slide, please. The 2023 version of the multifamily workbook is now available. The workbook is an Excel-based tool used to collect data regarding your application. The 2023 version must be used in the 2023 consolidated RFP our release notes are available online and they highlight the changes that we've made to this year's version. As Q noted, applicants must apply for funding using Minnesota Housing's customer portal. If your organization is new to the portal, you can request access through an online form available on our website on our multifamily customer portal resources page. Please request access as soon as possible and allow up to two business days for us to process your request. Lastly, as Q mentioned already, we released a series of recorded tutorials to support you throughout the application process while using our systems. They are also available on our portal resources page and are linked in e-news that we will be continuing to send out up until the application deadline. Tutorials include what's new in 2023, which highlights system changes for this application round, how to get started and apply for funding, steps to complete the intent to apply, setting up and managing your project checklists, and how to use the scoring wizard to complete the self-scoring process. Our hope is that by creating uh, short tutorials, you'll be able to access these when you need them throughout the process. I'll now uh, introduce Cody. Good morning and welcome everyone. My name is Cody Thurno and I manage the geographic priorities that are part of the multifamily consolidated RFP. I won't go into detail for each geographic priority area, but uh, I would like to highlight a few important items that may be relevant to some of you on the webinar. We have continued um, the whole harmless provision that was new um, with last year's scoring round, uh, where returning unfunded applicants from the 2022 consolidated RFP, uh, you have the option of using either the project's 2022 um, geographic score or you can use the 2023 geographic score. In most cases, uh, a project's geographic score is, is not gonna change from 2022 to 2023. Um, and in those cases, I would recommend for simplicity purposes, just using the 2023 uh, geographic score. 
if you do want to use your 2022 unfunded products geographic score, there is a checklist item uh, that you must submit stating you would like to use your 2022 score. Um, and if you are a new, um, if your application is for a new project or if a project received partial funding, or you simply did not apply in 2022, um, but did years prior, you must use the 2023 geographic score for the project. Um, if you have any questions as to what geographic score you should use for your application, please contact me and I'd be happy to uh, walk through that with you. You can locate the mapping application uh, known as Community Profiles to determine your project's geographic score uh, breakdown either from the consolidated RFP page on our website under application resources or by simply searching community profiles in our website's uh, search box. Finally, uh, I want to encourage applicants um, to request a review of an address's walk score uh, if it is close to meeting the walk score thresholds that are set in the transit and walkability scoring category. Uh, the methodology gu guide has directions on where to send a walk score review request. Um, we have seen applicants approve their project's walk score by doing this, which could potentially lead to an additional point in your uh, final score. Um, this request for a walk score review has been in place for many years now, and I really believe it, it is often um, overlooked by applicants. Um, however, those applicants that I am aware of uh, that have requested a review from walk score um, have seen an impact um, and um, ultimately led to an additional point. Um, those are all the uh, updates really on geographic uh, scoring. Uh, I'd like to now introduce Ashley Johnson with the Met Council to discuss their funding uh, opportunities. Ashley, we can't hear you. Hi, good morning. I am Ashley Johnson. I am one of the program managers at the, at the uh, Metropolitan Council and I manage the local housing incentives account. Next slide, please. So we at the Met Council have been partnering with Minnesota Housing uh, on LHIA since 1995. Uh, this particular account is for the preservation and development of affordable housing. So uh, for LHIA, the city or the county must be uh, technically the applicant. Um, LHIA is uh, for this for this part for multifamily development. Um, the cities must be LCA or livable communities participating communities. Um, all of this information is on uh, the portal and also I'll be available to answer any questions about this particular account. Um, the uh, livable communities at communities or um, participating communities can be cities or they could be uh, economic development entities or HRAs. We also consider applications directly from counties for which the project is located in. Um, and this particular program does require a local match from the entity uh, in which the project is located in. And that is a one-to-one -one match. Next slide, please. So here are some of the program priorities of LHIA. We prioritize rental units that are affordable at or below 30% of area median income. We also prioritize projects with larger uh, units, so three or more bedrooms is what we consider. Another one of our program priorities is uh, projects that serve people experiencing long-term homelessness. And lastly, we look at whether a proposal will provide a housing type that is not currently available uh, in or near the project area. Um, and what this could be is um, us considering whether a project, uh, even though, for example, uh, may be targeting at or below 30% of area median income, we consider uh, in every community's comprehensive plan, what are the affordable housing needs for that particular community? So for example, if in Edina, um, there's a need for 50% 
uh, AMI units, um, we also consider uh, a project that would include 50% AMI units at a different um, kind of scale or comparison um, because that particular uh, income is, or that particular uh, income is needed in that area. Um, and then LHA awards uh, are announced after Minnesota Housing Awards are made. So typically the board uh, approves all of the awards for Minnesota Housing in December. We take all of the projects uh, that we are choosing to fund to our board that following January. Um, so once again, most of LHIA stuff uh, is on our website and also Minnesota Housing's portal, but I am Ashley Johnson and I am here and I'm available to talk about any projects that may be um, particularly good for our uh, funding stream. And next I will pass it on to Karina. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, my name is Karina Serrano. I am with the St. Paul Public Housing Agency. I currently am the assistant director of our HPD program. I'm also temporarily serving as our interim director. Next slide, please. Um, that's not my next slide. <laughs> Okay, um, I will just go ahead um, and talk about what my next slide should have been. <laughs> I'm here covering um, the project-based vouchers that the PHA board has authorized. Um, we have authorized um, 125 of our traditional HCV units, um, and then our board has also authorized 25 additional units for um, out of our HUD bash allocation. Those that are applying for HUD VASH allocation, they also must get a approval from our from the local VA, um, or not approval, but support from the local VA. The other 125 are available for seniors, family unification program, mixed income, and supportive housing for those experiencing homelessness. For project-based vouchers, um, those that have not had experience with them, the assistance is tied to the unit and remains with the unit with the unit for the duration of the contract. Tenants residing in project base, they pay 30% of their adjusted gross income towards the rent, and then the PHA pays the rest. The goals of the P of PVB are to increase the supply of affordable housing in St. Paul, also to contribute to upgrading the long-term viability of St. Paul's housing stock. Um, and then we also are looking to um, increased housing option for our low income households in St. Paul. Um, and then where we can also integrate housing and supportive services um, to achieve household stability, um, we would like to do so. Um, we also look for our project-based vouchers to leverage additional funding or units if it makes the project more viable. And then we are also looking to support both the state and local goals of and you know, um, homelessness and achieve affordable housing. So those who are looking to apply for project-based vouchers, um, we will grant up to 25% of the units in the building or 25 units, whichever is greater, um, can be project-based. There are exceptions if um, the building is um, designated for elderly, which is defined for PVB 62 years or older. Um, or if the building provides supportive services. Those that meet this exception can actually be 100% project-based vouchers. Um, we will only entertain applications that apply for a minimum of 10 project-based vouchers. So if you're intending to apply, the minimum is 10. Um, you must also be willing to enter a housing assistance payment contract for up to 20 years. We do offer contracts for less than that, but we have the authority to enter up to 20 years at a time. Um, and then all applications must go through the Minnesota Housing Consolidated RFP, even though, um, even if you're not intending to apply for any additional funding. Um, that's where we make our application available. And more information can be found at our website at stpha.org, including my contact information. Thank you, and I will pass it over to Nicola. Thank you, Karina. 
Hello, everyone. My name is Nicola Vienna, and I'm the Housing Tax Credit Supervisor at Minnesota Housing. I will be sharing a few updates on the housing tax credits, primarily on the 9% tax credits. I will use the acronym HTC, which refers to the Federal Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. And I will also highlight changes to the Qualified Allocation Plan for 2024 and 2025, or the QAP. So we forward allocate credits. So this year for the 2023 multifamily consolidated RFP, we will be allocating 2024 HTCs. Next slide, please. Per federal statute, 9% tax credits are allocated to states based on a formula where we look at the state population and a per capita amount. The total for Minnesota for 2024 is about 15.7 million this year. The Minnesota housing allocation is estimated to be about 11.8 million. Each state receives a limited pool of 9% tax credit, and it is a competitive resource in the multifamily consolidated RFP. We recommend applying as a dual application where you apply for both a 9% HTC with or without deferred funding and a 4% HTC with the deferred funding to give you more options for selection. State statute establishes Minnesota Housing as the primary allocating agency with a number of cities and counties as sub allocators. So Minneapolis, St. Paul, Dakota and Washington counties have been have received their own allocations and they have their own qualified allocation plans. These amounts are posted on our website and on the sub allocators uh, websites as well. And projects within these sub allocator jurisdi jurisdictions are encouraged to apply for HTCs directly to these sub allocators. And we have a contact list on our website for those sub allocators. Per the QAP, Minnesota Housing will not accept applications for developments located within these jurisdictions for round one, unless the sub allocator has entered into a joint powers agreement with Minnesota Housing or has returned all of their HTCs to Minnesota Housing. Minnesota Housing will administer the HTCs for all areas outside of these jurisdictions. Next slide, please. The Internal Revenue Service, or IRS, requires every HTC allocator to have a plan for allocating credits to developments, which is the QAP. There are certain IRS and state requirements about what must be included in our QAP. In our QAP, we address geographic distribution, funding set-asides, funding rounds, guidance and procedures, and funding priorities. Our QAP requires us to distribute the HTCs proportionally to the metro and greater Minnesota. So we have a metro pool and a greater Minnesota pool based on population. We also have set-asides. We have the nonprofit set aside, which is a metro pool and a greater Minnesota pool. We also have the rural development set aside, which has been increased to $425,000 this year. Next slide. So next I will discuss the main changes in the 2024-2025 QAP and self-scoring worksheet. And please refer to the self-scoring worksheet for additional details. One of the biggest changes we made to the self-scoring worksheet was how applicants structure units for permanent supportive housing for high priority homeless and people with disabilities. Applicants now state whether the project is primarily supportive housing or partially supported housing. We also removed the continuum of care units. Vicki Farden will go over more details during her presentation. We also made modifications to the preservation section in the serves lowest income selection criteria. And Ann Heitlinger will cover what you need to know during her presentation. 
For increasing geographic choice, we combined all of the methodology documents into one document called the Methodology Guide. You can find this document on our website along with the other application resources. We also added the whole harmless provision that Cody mentioned. So Cody covered this in his presentation, so I refer to his comments there. But I also refer you to our methodology guide and to the community profiles on our website and reach out to Cody Thurno if you have questions. Next slide. We also had some changes to the supporting community and economic development selection criteria. For equitable development, we added language to help refine and clarify documentation requirements. We no longer require you to provide data that demonstrates the housing disparity. Also, we clarified the definition of a qualified stakeholder group and provided examples to make it more clear of what we're looking for. And we also added additional requirements for meaningful engagement. A minimum of two meetings is required in order to demonstrate meaningful engagement with communities most impacted. Again, I refer you to the self-scoring worksheet where there's more information. For the Black, Indigenous, People of Color, and Women-Owned Business Enterprise category, we increased the amount of overall points available. We added a new tier specifically for ownership and sponsorship, and we added a new tier under the existing partnership. So again, please read the self-scoring worksheet and the scoring guide, which is a supplement to the self-scoring worksheet for more details. And next slide. The last update I will highlight for the self-scoring worksheet is the building characteristics criteria called enhanced sustainability. Enhanced sustainability is when the applicant incorporates certain sustainability criteria into the design of the project. We added a fourth pointing tier for projects certified with passive house or, an, or alternative building performance pathways. Passive house is a construction concept where the standard is to be more energy efficient and our knowledgeable staff architects can speak more uh, knowledgeably about this than myself, but I wanted to highlight it here. Uh, so Erica will speak more to this, but please request technical assistance if you want to learn more. And then lastly, I want to highlight two changes to the QAP. We, the HTC development limit has been increased to 1.7 million. This is an increase from 1.3 million in the last QAP. And then we have a new definition, amount, and requirements for the rural development set aside. The set aside is now 425,000. And again, I refer you to the QAP for uh, that definition and eligibility. So now I would like to turn it over to William Price to go over housing infrastructure bonds. Thank you, Nicola. Um, hello, everyone, and good morning. My name is William Price, and I am the Housing Infrastructure Bond Program Manager here at Minnesota Housing. Um, I'll be sharing a few updates on the Housing Infrastructure Bond Program, and we will use the acronym HIV. Next slide, please. So under the uh, governor's proposed budget, a request of $250 million has been made from the legislature specifically for housing infrastructure bonds, which is the largest request made since the program's inception. As Commissioner Ho mentioned earlier, there is also the potential for HIV cash or direct legislative appropriation as well. And we'll have to see what kind of comes out of the uh, fin final bills for uh, the current legislative session. The current multifamily eligible uses for HIVs are permanent supportive housing for people experiencing homelessness, independent living for senior households ages 55 and above, and the preservation of projects with existing rental assistance. Proposed this year by Minnesota Housing is a new eligible use for new construction projects that are affordable to households at or below 50% AMI. Please note that this proposed use has not yet been approved by the legislature, nor is it currently included in state statute. Next slide, please. 
One of the most beneficial utilities of HIVs is flexibility in how it can be structured to finance a project. HIVs can be paired with tax credits, 4% tax credits specifically, or they can be what we call a HIV deferred only loan, meaning that the tax credits are not involved in the final capital stack for the project. When paired with volume cap, the HIV loan is used to assist the project in meeting the 50% test for 4% tax credits. This is the preferred structure when syndication proceeds make up a significant portion of the capital sources. For HIV deferred only, the loan is essentially filling the gap from the emission of tax credit syndication equity proceeds. This structure allows resources in the consolidated RFP to be maximized and stretches volume cap utilization. All HIV eligible projects with a nonprofit or a governmental entity as the sponsor may be evaluated for this deferred, this deferred only structure where the loan may be forgivable or repayable. And our multifamily RFP standards includes more information on HIV deferred applications. Um, so again, if you're a sponsor that is nonprofit or governmental entity, uh, please reference the RFP standards for more information on that. Next slide, please. So the bond test analysis is a spreadsheet that links to the multifamily workbook, extrapolates data, and evaluates if the project is meeting state and federal bond tests. The analysis tool is required to be submitted with all HIV eligible project applications. Included is an evaluation of whether the project meets the 50% test for tax credits and a test of whether there are enough sources to pay for costs that are ineligible to be covered by bond proceeds. Community service facilities are spaces and housing projects that may not be exclusively used by project tenants. Generally, the cost of these spaces are not eligible for financing with bond proceeds. So please contact our team, myself, or one of our underwriters for technical assistance if your project may include this type of space. Next slide, please. So HIVs have been a critical tool um, since the program's inception in 2012 um, to create um, housing for low-income seniors. To be eligible, senior projects must provide independent living where all units serve at least one senior who's age 55 and above. The project, um, again, must be independent living and assisted living projects are not eligible for HIV proceeds. A completed senior housing narrative must be submitted in the application. The project must also provide access to services to residents and demonstrate the ability to increase physical supports and supportive services as residents age and experience increasing levels of disability. At a minimum, um, at least a part-time tenant service coordinator must be included in the project uh, budget for, for long-term viability of the project. So there are um, selection priorities for senior housing, and they include a project's ability to serve uh, very low income seniors at or below 30% uh, AMI. So certainly it's best practice to include as many of those units as, as possible um, in your project. Next slide, please. HIVs are also Minnesota's uh, primary tool for providing uh, new units of supportive housing. To be eligible for the permanent supportive housing use of HIVs, all units in a project must serve homeless households and can include singles, youth, veterans, families, and people with severe and persistent mental illness and substance use disorders. To address capital needs of existing federally assisted and housing with existing income or rent restrictions, HIVs have also been an important tool to preserve affordable housing projects prevent unit loss, and avert the displacement of households. Preservation projects must meet a preservation risk of loss with critical physical needs, risk of market conversion, or ownership capacity. I will now hand it back over to uh, Summer Jefferson to give you more information on our federal programs. Thank you. All right, thank you, William. 
So I just want to give a, a brief update on some of our federal programs, which includes um, the home and NHGF programs. The program manager for uh, these programs is Aaron Kaniski. So if you have any additional questions, you can uh, we can connect you uh, with him. Um, next slide, please. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's the right slide. Um, So for Home and National Housing Trust Fund, here is a list of all the eligible uses, uh, new construction, rehabilitation, acquisition. Uh, it goes into detail about uh, which the, what the targets are for each of the specific programs. Um, uh, one thing to note is that rehabilitation can include the conversion of existing non-residential uh, non buildings to a residential building. Um, as highlighted previously in the presentation, we do encourage familiar, some familiarity with the deferred loan funding sources and project eligibility um, as you uh, put together your applications. Uh, for workforce projects, we, do, we encourage familiarity with home. Uh, and then for permanent supportive housing projects, we definitely encourage familiarity with the uh, National Housing Trust Fund uh, program. Uh, as these projects and these those projects can also receive home funds as well. Uh, federal cross cutting requirements uh, for federal programs in, can include uh, environmental review, Section 3, the Uniform Relocation Act or URA, uh, Davis Bacon, among other requirements, uh, depending on which, which one of the programs, if you receive uh, home or NHTF. We select approximately two to four projects a year for home and or NHTF funds. So some familiarity with these requirements, um, if you're applying for our deferred loan funding sources is encouraged in case you are selected um, for the funds. Uh, if your project will involve any uh, demolition, rehabilitation or, or and or conversion of an existing residential or commercial building, currently uh, occupied by any tenants. Uh, just want to start involuntary displacement prior to selection should be, uh, is, is not allowed and should be avoided. Next slide. Uh, NHTF operating subsidy is another eligible use for the NHTF funds. Uh, the NHTF capital funds are what is most often paired with our supportive housing projects. Uh, all NHTF assisted units uh, for must be restricted to 30% AMI income and rent and uh, rent limits in addition to meeting any all the other program requirements. Um, next slide. So these forms can provide key information about a project that could uh, preclude uh, uh, if. Uh, it from being eligible for home or NHTF uh, uh, funding. Um, so in the application checklist items, you will see one of them is the application uh, applicant certification of known environmental issues. So this, this form actually provides information about the uh, suitability of uh, the environment of the site location that you picked and the surrounding land uses that could impact the project. That is something that we look at during our uh, review process to just make sure that your project would be eligible for these home and HTF uh, projects. It's also something that we take into consideration. Uh, if there are some complexities, then maybe there's another potential funding source that could work better for your project. So please make sure that you fill out the information as, as uh, completely as possible. Um, also in the multifamily rental housing narrative, there are questions that provide information about the historic about historic properties um, that could be in, impacted by the project, special populations that will be served, and then whether uh, any actions, whether that's acquisition, demolition, rehabilitation, or site prep have or are planned to kind of occur prior to or shortly after selection. So all this information is helpful so that we can, one, ascertain how, it, how you overlap with these programs to see if you are a good fit for the program, uh, and then start to um, look towards uh, post-election to make sure that we can uh, ensure that we are in compliance. Um, so now I'd like to uh, hand it over and introduce Ann Heitlinger. And 
And you are you're muted. There we go. Better. <laughs> uh, good morning. I am Ann Heitlinger. I'm the underwriting manager at Minnesota Housing, and I'm going to cover preservation updates this morning. Next slide, please. Do we have it up? Great. Uh, as in previous years, the preservation category continues to have two components, a threshold risk of loss and then an assignment of points. The new QAP maintains the three risks of loss from previous years, critical physical needs, market conversion, and owner capacity commitment. A project must provide documentation that it meets a risk of loss to be scored for points. In pointing, the agency continues to prioritize funding existing properties with project-based rental assistance, and secondarily, properties with existing public funding that provide housing affordable to households earning less than 50% of MTSP with a minimum tax subsidy period. In this QAP, we have streamlined the points into two categories from three. Tier one, is for projects with project-based rental assistance, and tier two is for projects with a deed restriction on at least 50% of the units at 50% of the MTSP. Please note that in taking preservation points in this category, it's mutually exclusive with rental assistance and serves lowest income, in some cases by property or by units within a property. Additionally, a property with a project-based rental assistance contract that does not meet a risk of loss cannot take points for rental assistance. Please review the notes in the self-scoring worksheet and in the scoring guide for further details. An issue that comes up each year for properties with an owner preference or restriction to serve households that are both senior and disabled is whether these projects can take points under senior housing or persons with disabilities. And the answer is no. Projects serving seniors must have all units intended for a senior population. And for units we are creating that serve persons with disabilities, we don't want those to be in properties with any age restrictions even if the disabled persons are not required to be seniors themselves. Applicants are offered, often concerned that not being able to complain, not being able to claim these other categories of points will place them at a disadvantage with respect to other properties. But since these dynamics affect each preservation project equally, there is not a disadvantage compared to other preservation projects. Next slide, please. To take preservation points, the rental assistance, the tax credits, or the deed restriction must have been placed for 15 years or more. And this must be documented in the application. A fairly common error is for projects to submit a Section 8 renewal form, which doesn't show the original date of the contract or that the contract has been in place for 15 years. It's good practice to find this documentation early as you may need to request additional assistance from a funder, the seller, Minnesota Housing, HUD, or Rural Development in order to have the proper documentation. For projects selecting a, the risk of loss that is critical physical needs, we have simplified the critical needs form to reflect only one year of reserves and cash flow rather than three. Hopefully that will be simpler for applicants to complete this year. To determine whether your project has critical physical needs in the agency's definition, please care for, carefully review the agency design standards document, chapter eight. This document can be found on the building standards page on the website. And please be aware that during the formal application review, agency architects will be relying solely on the submitted application materials to make their determination that projects meet these requirements. Make sure that all the documents in the application are telling the same story about the condition of the building and its components. In past applications, we have seen that there are physical needs assessments, which for example, indicate that a boiler's 
condition is satisfactory. It's not failing. It's not expected to fail imminently. However, in the scope of work or in the critical needs form or in the 20 year projection, we see the boiler listed as being a critical physical need. This mismatch in the documentation means that the staff cannot conclusively determine the project boiler meets the threshold requirements. So please make sure your documents are all telling the same story. They're all consistent with one another. If your capital needs assessment does not contain photographs, I recommend that you use the site photographs that are required as a, in the application to further tell the story about the condition of the property and its physical needs, not just provide a general overview of the buildings and grounds. If you would like further clarity on the critical physical needs standards, we can connect you with an agency architect. Thank you. And I would now like to introduce Aaron Coons to discuss underwriting. So good morning, everyone. My name is Erin Coons, and I'm an underwriter for the agency. And today I'll be going over some general underwriting information and updates for this year's RFP. Uh, next slide, please. Um, good. Uh, so on our website is still the best place to get your application started. Um, the most updated materials can be found under the multifamily consolidated RFP page. Um, the menu on the left side of the page is still where you can find um, the updated underwriting standards, directions to the customer portal, rent and income limits, and program guides and materials. Next slide. Um, so we review and size deferred awards as we have in prior years. First, by looking at the operating budget and making sure that the rent and um, expenses are in line with either your prior year operations or similar to other properties within our portfolio. Uh, we also confirm that both the rents and the restrictions are achievable. From there, we review the development budget, making sure contingencies, developer fee, uh, both upfront and deferred, bond and loan fees, and the appropriate reserves are included um, if they are applicable. Lastly, we um, will then size the housing tax credits if they are requested, and then from there we will size our defer or size the deferred loan request. Um, so the me this method helps us to utilize one of the most sacred resources effectively and to help fund as many applications as possible. Next slide, please. Um, so technical assistance is available up until the applications are due. If you'd like to schedule technical assistance, please complete the form on our website, which can be found under the multifamily consolidated RFP page. Um, technical assistance can be provided not only for underwriting, but program design and operations questions. After the RFP due date, we are limited in our ability to reach out to you regarding your development. So working with staff ahead of time can give us a better understanding of your development. Next slide. So navigating industry issues. Um, first, um, what's most important is to tell us your story. We want to hear from you regarding your numbers. We want to understand the story and the reasoning behind them. This helps us to understand your project better and answer any of the why questions during the period where we may not be able to follow up with you. Um, starting with your current budget, uh, what is and isn't included in it? Have you adjusted the numbers in any way? Um, does your development budget reflect cost escalation? If so, what is that escalation based on? Do you have any background document documentation for why you're escalating the numbers the way you are? Um, and also, um, are you building any cushion into interest rates if they aren't agency um, provided loans? Moving on to construction financing. Um, so for our current bridge loan financing, we are seeing uh, escalating rates. Um, so being conservative when estimating your rate is advised. As we get closer to the RFP date, we can provide you a rate that you should use. Um, this rate would, will be adjusted at the time 
of um, final underwriting if, the if your development is selected. Um, the rate provided will be based on limiting gaps later on during the underwriting process. In regards to your permanent financing, um, we don't, or in regards to our permanent financing, we don't have an advertised rate um, for our interest rate yet um, for this RFP. Rates will be set sometime in the summer um, or sometime in the early summer. If you'd like to start modeling your development with any estimated rates, you can add 1% to our current advertised rates. Um, if selected at the time of um, internal feasibility, we will set the rate to what we are able to hold as detailed in the second selection letter. Um, our hold on the rate is unique as the agency is taking on all of the risk um, for that time period. Uh, we cannot follow up with everybody in regards to the numbers that they have used, so providing detail in either the narrative or a separate document is imperative to helping us understand the methodology behind your budget and your request. Um, we can modify numbers as part of our feasibility review, but we'll consider adjustments from you that are documented. Um, agency underwriting standard is still your best guide uh, for how the development will be reviewed overall. Um, I appreciate you all taking the time to help us kick off the RFP. And with that, I would like to now turn the presentation over to Erica Arms, who will be going over architectural updates. Thank you, Erin. Um, this is Erica Arms. I'm one of the three staff architects here at Minnesota Housing, and we'll just briefly go over some architecture and construction updates. Um, next slide, please. Uh, when, when the first things you're going to want to do, if you haven't already, is on the building standards webpage. Down at the bottom, there's a link to sign up for our building standards e-news. And we'll be releasing and posting this uh, probably next week. And this will go over um, changes from the previous years. Uh, in addition to the major highlights we're going over today, there might be some minor other changes and that'll all be in the e-news. So be sure to check that out. Next slide. Uh, in the multifamily selection scoring, um, as you've heard earlier today, uh, an added tier four for enhanced sustainability is now an option for you. Um, there's four points, and this is for passive house, zero energy pedal, zero carbon pedal, or living building challenge. Um, this new tier uh, recognizes projects that will consume very little energy over their life and are certified to these programs. Um, be sure to refer to chapter four of our 2023 Minnesota overlay and guide to the 2020 Enterprise Green Communities um, for more details on these different tiers and how they could possibly be combined with other tiers to maximize your scoring points. Next slide. Um, also in the Minnesota overlay, you'll want to refer to criteria 5.1a, um, building performance standard for new construction. Um, new this year is Energy Star certification is required for your applicable program. Um, this Energy Star certification is required for new construction projects, regardless of if you've chosen a tier three or tier four enhanced sustainability. Um, and then the key with the Energy Star certification is that the field verification measures of the program will be met for all projects. Um, and this does include housing tax credit only projects for application. Uh, just to clarify, Enterprise Green Communities criteria certification is not required just Energy Star certification. And again, the Minnesota overlay um, posted for 2023 will have more information on that requirement. Next slide. Um, for projects that are going to claim the universal design RFP selection points, you're gonna wanna indicate that on the self-scoring worksheet, include the universal design worksheet at application, and what's new this year is that 
for senior housing projects um, that William had reviewed. Uh, you're going to also complete this universal design worksheet. Chapter five of our 2023 rental housing design and construction standards has more information on that worksheet. Next slide. Uh, this year we did make some changes to the architect's guide. Um, chapter two for architecture and engineering services, uh, design build delivery method for mechanical, electrical, and plumbing uh, is now allowed if pre-approved. Um, the Minnesota Housing Architects can help you with that. Um, and it's based on the experience of your entire development team. Chapter three of the architect's guide, uh, we updated the architecture compensation chapter. Um, now the compensation schedule includes high and low fee ranges for professional fees. And this is based on building class type and construction cost. So we created three building classes um, to recognize a typical range of complexity and thus the fees would follow that accordingly. And so these were, um, this schedule was helped developed with an external uh, advisory group of architects. So we're, we'll be happy to hear your comments on how this is, how this goes this year. Uh, next slide. For the construction cost estimate that you're submitting for the RFP, uh, use today's construction costs at the time of application. Um, but it is acceptable to include a separate itemized cost for escalation for materials and labor, as long as you call that out. Um, we're happy to talk over that with you, any of the staff architects, if you have questions. Um, the costs that we're seeing in construction have stabilized a bit, but we are still hearing about supply chain issues for uh, electrical switchgear panels and residential appliances and projects are working working around those as best they can. Uh, let's see, I'm going to turn it over to Karen Polito now, who's gonna go over some asset management updates. Thank you. Thanks, Erica. Good morning, I'm Karen Polito with the asset management team. I will be explaining asset management's role in the RFP process. Next slide, please. The asset management team reviews rents, operating expenses, and the vacancy rate for each project. Next slide, please. First, let's talk about expenses. We review your operating budget, specifically management and operating expenses, which we refer to as M&O. This is your operating budget before property taxes and reserves. We have a portfolio of over 300 properties with first mortgages and or HIB loans that we collect operating data for. We compare your operating budget with five to six comparable properties on a per room basis. Comparable properties are selected based on building type. For example, elevator, walk-up or townhome property, uh, the total number of units and rooms in the property, and location. We make sure to compare expenses using multiple management companies because we see management companies change frequently in our portfolio for a variety of reasons. We want to make sure that any property selected can easily be managed by multiple partners. As a process improvement, we are no longer recommending adjustments to your development's operating budget when the proposed budget falls within 1% of our comparable properties actual numbers. We are looking to see if your development's operating budget is within a reasonable range of our comparables or if there's a large deviation. For 2022 RFP selected projects, here are the range of adjustments that we made. The average adjustment was 3%. Adjustments range from decreasing the operating budget 6% to increasing the budget 18%. We compared the per unit numbers to Novogratz's 2022 multifamily rental housing operating expense report, 
that analyzes 1,200 LIHTC properties nationwide and found that for properties under 50 units, our data is very much in line with the national average. For properties larger than 100 units, uh, we don't have as many comparables in our portfolio, so it's important for you to submit the new construction comparable property form for large properties so that we can accurately assess the proposed budget. We can provide technical assistance prior to you submitting your application and give you a management and operating m and per room number to use in your workbook. Please submit the technical assistance form on our website and submit a completed workbook to obtain this information. Regarding vacancy rate, recently we have been recommending 5% vacancy instead of our previous standard of 7% on most workforce housing projects. This helps to reduce funding gaps and increase the number of units that can be funded. Supportive housing projects and projects in weak markets will still be underwritten with a higher vacancy. Please refer to the new underwriting standards document on our website for more information. Next slide, please. In regards to rents, we look at the market study, the rent limits you selected in the self-scoring worksheet, including deeper rent targeting thresholds, and we look at our portfolio data as needed to back up your proposed rents. Please make sure that your market study meets all of our requirements, including that it's performed by one of our approved providers. And if you're doing income averaging, make sure it addresses units at higher rent levels. All unit types and rent levels should be addressed in the market study. If you have any questions, please get in touch with me. Now I'll turn it over to Vicki. Great, thanks, Karen. Hi, I'm Vicki Farden, and I'm the Supportive Housing Team Lead at Minnesota Housing, and I'll cover updates for Supportive Housing this year. Next slide. We've made some significant changes this year to the application process for Supportive Housing. As Q mentioned earlier, we know the application process can be challenging and doesn't allow a lot of time for planning with community partners to create the support of housing units to meet the local needs. There's also limited resources for supportive housing, rental assistance and services. And then there's some areas of the state that don't have a need for more high priority homeless units, especially when they're also required to meet the long-term homeless eligibility based on their funding source. That also applies to units for people with disabilities that use the LTH eligibility. So our goals are to simplify the application process and create supportive housing units that better meet community needs. So we created two categories for applications with supportive housing. The requirements are quite different depending on the type of supportive housing that you'll be doing. So for partially supportive housing, which is fewer than 50% of the total units will be used to serve high priority homeless, persons with disabilities, and other homeless households. Those applications will be more conceptual with the planning work happening after selection. And then for primarily supportive housing, where 50% or more of the units are for supportive housing, we still require the same type of planning and application materials we've had in the past. Next slide. So to address our goals, we made several changes to the self scoring worksheet. For high priority homeless units, we eliminated the COC household type priority points. For selected projects, we added an option to consider an alternative to coordinated entry for referral and prioritization process, processes for populations not included in coordinated entry. And we eliminated the support of housing threshold criteria and documentation requirements we had previous, previously. 
And as I said, we changed the application requirements based on the project type for partial or primarily supportive housing. And then we added a market review during the application feasibility review phase. So if there's not a market need for HPH units, we will convert those to 30% MTSP um, income limits with the priority to serve households experiencing homelessness. And then for PWD units, we eliminated the threshold criteria and the documentation requirements. We also added the market review if homelessness is required for the units if using long-term homeless housing support. The population market need and resource plan for the PWD units will be determined after selection in consultation with the county or tribal human services. Next application, next, <laughs> next slide, please. So for partially supportive, have, supportive housing applications, as I mentioned, projects that will be partial supportive housing will be more conceptual and are not required to develop a plan for the units at the time of application. So this includes identifying a specific population to be served, having a designated service provider, or identifying committed resources for rental assistance and services, with a few exceptions. For If you're applying for Section 811 PRA, you'll need to complete that pre-application and application materials. And we also encourage all applicants to try to secure project-based rental assistance for their supportive housing units. There's only two required application forms for partial supportive housing, which are the partially supportive housing certification form and the notification to the COC and county or tribal human services form. So this is just a notice that you submit to them. You're not required to meet with them or have them complete a form. And then you'll also need to follow the underwriting assumptions that are outlined on the certification form. Next slide. There's also some optional forms and submissions that you might want to submit if you need them for other points. Uh, the service provider qualification form if you have a service partner that meets the requirement to claim points for Black, Indigenous, people of color, and women-owned business category, or the housing support commitment form if needed for rental assistance points. There's also underwriting assumptions to follow. So for setting the rent levels, if project-based rental assistance is not secured at the time of application, Assume that housing support can be secured after selection and set the rents following the underwriting standards for housing support. And then to make sure basic tenant service coordination can be provided and not totally dependent on billable services, applicants must include expenses for basic service coordination in the operating budget on the unique operating expense line. The expenses should be calculated based on the anticipated types of other funding available for services as shown here. The rents and unique operating expenses may be adjusted during our feasibility review and will be determined after selection in collaboration with the applicant. Next slide. So once we get to the feasibility review, at that time, we will consult with the local COC and county or tribal human services to determine the market need for the HPH units. If there's not a demonstrated market need, the HPH units will convert to 30% rent restricted units with a priority to serve households experiencing homelessness. The applicant does not lose the HPH points. And we'll also review the market need for PWD units that plan to use LTH housing support. 
So we may also adjust the project workbook to change rent levels or unique operating costs for the supportive housing units during our feasibility review. Next slide. So once a project, a partially supportive housing project is selected for funding, then we'll work with the applicant and the community partners to plan the supportive housing units, which might include determining the population to be served, adjusting the unit size types, selecting a service provider, and determining the referral sources and process to select eligible households. We'll also work with you to determine a secure resource for rental assistance and services, and adjust the workbook as needed through that process. And then the selected applicant completes all the due diligence materials to close on the financing. Next slide. So now moving on to applications that are primarily supportive housing. Those applications are quite different and are similar to what we've done in the past and require a well-developed supportive housing plan at the time of application. So the application materials include the COC confirmation form. Applicants still need to meet with the COC to present their proposals and receive feedback from the COC. The supportive housing narrative, which has been combined with the PWD narrative, and covers the plan for both, for all the high priority homeless PWD and other homeless units, which is completed by the service provider and the county or tribal human services when you're including PWD units. There's also the service provider qualification form and the applicants still need to submit documentation showing funding commitments for service funding and rental assistance. And then don't forget to indicate the HPH and PWD units on the workbook and note the rental assistance sources. And then remember, as William mentioned, that HIB requires homeless eligibility for supportive housing for all the units. Next slide. And then a few last things I want to point out is to make sure that the owner and management agent are familiar with their tenant selection plan guidelines and materials. And also check out our new supportive housing standards that were adopted by the supportive housing by the supportive housing alliance, which is an interagency working group of funders and industry organizations. These are the recommended best practices for supportive housing for Minnesota housing funding. So please share that with your project partners, the service provider and management agent. And then I just want to also uh, mention that we'll have the supportive housing TA session on May 3rd, if you'd like to learn more about the application this year and bring your questions. So now I'll pass it to Ellie Miller to tell you about HUD Section 811. Hello everyone, my name is Ellie Miller and I am the program manager for the HUD Section 811 PRA program. Section 811 PRA is a project-based rental assistance available in this RFP for people with disabilities. Section 811 PRA is in a separate tier, tier two in the people with disabilities section. Tier two has a different unit percentage and point breakout than tier one with a total of 13 points if 15 to 25% of the total units is used for people with disabilities using Section 811 PRA. Section 811 PRA limits the total number of units to 11 and can be no more than 25% of the supportive housing units, which includes any unit set aside for people with disabilities. This is important to consider for eligibility as it's a HUD rule. There is a pre-application that Vicki mentioned that is required to determine eligibility and the pre-application is due Thursday, April 27th. The pre-application is important as you can determine your eligibility early to better plan for your supportive housing options. Later, as part of the application process, 
you will complete an 811 PWD narrative, which is signed by a representative at the Department of Human Services. Lastly, uh, final approval for Section 811 PRA funding is contingent on the project selection for capital funding. I would now like to hand it back over to our Assistant Commissioner, James Lenhoff. There we go. Hey, Summer, do you want to do Q&A first and then I'll do the closing remarks? I'd, I'd like to say that I could answer all the Q&A questions, but that's probably not true. Yes. <clears throat> all right. So let me. Okay, so we would, um, we'll move into the Q&A section of uh, today's presentation. Thank you all for all of the uh, information that you provided so far. Um, so I'm going all the panelists to turn on their cameras and then we are ready to answer any questions that come in um, through the question box. Again, you can submit your question uh, via chat, the question box. You can also raise your hand. Uh, the, raise the button and we will unmute you uh, on your line or type it into the question chat box. So we have a couple, I think a couple questions. Uh, we'll start with one of the questions that we received was um, generally if my, the, the question is, is whether or not a project uh, located in Minneapolis should apply through Minneapolis as a sub allocator application or use the multi or or through Minnesota housing through the portal. So we don't I don't have enough information about the specific project, but generally I think this is alluding to some of the things that Nicola talked about as far as like whether for 9% tax credits, whether or not you can apply to us or sub allocator. So it will depend on the the type of what, what you're looking for. So if you are just applying for 9% tax credits. If you are a nonprofit, you can apply to Minnesota Housing. If, if the entity or the applicant is a nonprofit, you can apply to Minnesota Housing and to Minneapolis for the 9% tax credits. Um, if you are looking for deferred funding or uh, in addition to tax credits, you can still apply to Minnesota Housing for the deferred funding, and we do coordinate with um, with all of our, our, our collaborating funding partners on applications around the same time that come in to kind of uh, see from a 9% perspective and other, uh, other components too. So hopefully that's a little bit, or that, that's helpful in that you can apply for 9% tax credits if you are a nonprofit, if you're a for-profit, you can still apply to Minnesota Housing as a uh, for the deferred funding or as a dual application to be considered uh, as a, a deferred only or deferred with a 4% structure. Uh, if you have any additional uh, questions, again, use please uh, reach out to us for TA um, and we'll be able to walk through the specifics for your actual project that you're considering. It looks like there are a number of questions coming in. Um, did we have any hands that are raised or Sarah, do you? I think it ended up going into the, uh, the question box. Question box. So the next question uh, is probably for uh, Ann Heitlinger. It's about the rents. And the question is, are small area fair market rents used in the underwriting review or are there other rent standards that are used? Thanks for that. Can you hear me? Yes. Thanks for that question, Summer. Um, when we are reviewing the rents proposed by a project in an application, we are looking in a, to a comparison to the market study and to the rent and income limits that are reflected uh, in the workbook for the project. We do have deep targeting requirements with for all projects that apply that have to meet the payment standard in the jurisdiction in which the housing is being built. 
So to the extent that a PHA may be using a small market area fair market rent for their payment standard, then it would be incorporated into our analysis. Um, however, if that doesn't influence the PHA's payment standard, then we're probably not looking at it. We do do additional just comparative analysis in terms of where project rents are in relationship to the FMR, but since that's really a standard um, applied to PHAs and not to any of our resources, it's not a key metric that we use. Thanks. Thank you, Ann. All right, um, we have another question. Um, it's in regards to the underwriting standards and can we provide a link to the 2023 underwriting standards? Those will be coming soon to our website. Um, we anticipate in the next couple of weeks. So if you can just make sure that you're signed up for our e-news. Uh, I think that's the same thing for our rental housing design standards. Uh, we will send an e-news out when they are available on our website. How Summer, I do just want to say, though, for the key underwriting features that people would need for an application, vacancy standards, uh, inflators on income and expenses, um, developer fee, general requirements, and other things for contractors, those will remain unchanged. So I do think that as people are working on their workbooks now, they could use the 2022 standards that are already published on the website and then refer to the new document when it comes out. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, and then we do have one hand that is raised. I can't see. Mandy. Mandy. Patty, could you unmute? Oh, there we go. Yes, I actually then posted it on the chat. This was regarding Section 811 PRA funding. Do the Section 811 units need to be 25% of total units or 25% of the supportive units in a partially supportive housing project? That's a great question. Thank you for that question. Section 811 PRA, the 25% threshold is for the total of supportive housing units in your development. And specifically, we're looking at the supportive housing that is um, determined for people with disabilities. So if you're using rental assistance for populations let's say um, the high priority homeless population and you're using a rental assistance such as housing support, housing support requires that you have a disability to be eligible. So we would need to count those housing support units in the 25% total. So it's 25% of all of the, the development and it's specifically for supportive housing. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mandy. Uh, the next question is probably for Erica. It's a universal design question. The, does the universal design requirement apply to rehab senior housing? You know, I don't think so because I'm not sure if those are eligible for the senior housing funds with HIV. I guess if they are, um, that could be a William question as well. But um, if rehabs can claim those HIVs, then they would be required. And yes, so no HIVs can fund um, senior projects that are undergoing rehab. Um, okay. So Thanks, William. Erica, are there any carve outs, I guess, for or differences for rehab properties? When do you take that yes. into consideration? Universal Thanks design? for asking. Yep. Thanks for asking that, Summer. You'll want to just check um, to make sure the type of building can meet the requirements. I think for apartment buildings with elevators, it's not um, too difficult to meet, but for walk ups, 
and projects that um, don't have elevators, you'll want to look at the criteria on the worksheet carefully to make sure that you can, in fact, we, that's one of the things we'll be looking at in the feasibility review is just to make sure that the actual building, um, if it's not elevator served, can meet the, the threshold and the minimum requirements. So um, they are a little less restrictive for rehabs. There's some carve outs there, but um, there's still, could be a challenge if you don't have an elevator. Okay, thank you, Erica. And then let's see, there is a question, we'll go to this, uh, is intent to apply met by setting up the, pro the portal for a project? Um, yes. Uh, essentially, the intent to apply is uh, our way of under, you are submitting characteristics into the portal, letting us know that you are intending to apply to the uh, RFP, you fill out the certain characteristics, it kind of what we call spins up a checklist that essentially, um, and once you hit submit in the uh, portal, then that is all that you need to do. Uh, you, Karen, can you, just want to make sure I'm saying it all correctly too, but then also I think we put some additional pieces in place this year to make sure that you, it's very clear that you have submitted it, you get an email back. Um, is there anything else to add, Karen? Um, so one thing I, I'll plug that we have a tutorial specifically about intent to apply this year. Um, I think it's under five minutes, so do take a look at that. There's two pieces that you need to do. One is to create a project, um, and the second piece is to identify your project characteristics. In both cases, you're providing some preliminary data about your project. So you can make changes about the, that information after the fact. So say you put in some estimated construction costs, you're not sure what the final cost will be, you can come in and modify that later. Uh, so we definitely encourage you to go ahead and do those two steps if you're even considering your app, putting in an app, um, and know that you can change it at a later date. The other thing I wanted to note is that um, if you create a project in the portal and you ultimately decide that you aren't going to come in with a full app, there is a withdraw button in the portal so you can click that and it lets our staff know that you're no longer wanting to be considered for funding. Thanks, Karen. All right, and the last question uh, is for Erica. Uh, it's regarding architectural services. So if our organization has a separate legal entity for architectural services, basically a staff member that is licensed, is a licensed architect, can we utilize our entity or do we need to use an outside firm? And this may be, maybe it might be something that we could connect off, uh, offline also, but yeah, so if the development team, I think that would maybe fall under uh, identity of interest. Um, so we have, if I understand it correctly, we have certainly had projects where the development team has an arm that's an architecture firm. And um, there is an extra form to disclose what that all means. And we can help out with that online. I think that should be one of the forums posted. So. Um, it is allowable as long as you disclose it. Um, and any one of the staff architects can work with you offline on making sure you've got access to that um, form. All right, thanks, Erica. Well, that concludes the questions. Um, again, we're all available for questions moving forward. Uh, please. Uh, submit the TA form uh, so that if you're you have project specific in, uh, questions that you'd like to talk to any of the staff, program staff, architectural staff, underwriting, uh, we're happy to meet with you as you begin to kind of explore all of the different modifications from a scoring perspective in the checklist items. Uh, happy to connect with uh, with you um, moving forward, and I'll hand it back over to James for closing remarks. Yeah, thank you, Summer, and thank you everyone for sharing your time with us today. So I want to uh, first just do a little bit of context setting and then do uh, a quick time machine trip. So if you can just bear with me for a few minutes, I would really appreciate that. I, I know that uh, time can be scarce, especially 
coming off all the information here at the Consolidated RFP Technical Assistance Launch. One of the things I wanted to note earlier in the presentation from Summer is it was referenced that the Consolidated RFP is uniquely Minnesotan. Now, what the heck do we mean by uniquely Minnesotan? Some of you probably know the long history, but some of you may not be aware. But Minnesota Housing Finance Agency is relatively unique around the country. Although every state does have its own version of a housing finance agency, not all of them are fortunate to have the level of state or even some of the federal resources that Minnesota Housing gets to allocate through our consolidated RFP process. Uh, in a number of states, and I have colleagues that I connect with on a regular basis, they have multiple RFPs a year to fund a single project. So even when we look at the complexity, and it can be complex in a consolidated RFP, um, the alternative that some other states do is that they just have many different RFPs for each funding source. The other part that we have here in Minnesota is multiple sources of state appropriations, which is absolutely fantastic and represents the governors, not just the current administration, but many administrations, and the legislature's commitment to funding affordable housing in Minnesota. But when we have multiple funding sources, it also means we're trying to meet multiple statutes and multiple sets of rules within the same process. But again, that's uh, the reason we're trying to coordinate all of this into a single consolidated RFP versus multiple RFPs over the course of time to fund a single project. So there is a balancing that goes along with that. But now let me uh, just uh, do a little time machine trip uh, here for a moment. And I wanna be careful because the last few years have not been easy for many people for any variety of reasons. But I think a little bit of history is important with the consolidated RFP and as we're looking ahead to the results of this uh, legislative session. So back in 2019 and in 2020, both of those years of consolidated RFPs, Minnesota Housing was able to select a near record number of projects. Now I can't see the faces of all the different attendees, but I can see the faces of many Minnesota Housing employees. And I know that we all felt it, just the sheer number of projects from those years. And just uh, for context, uh, if we go back to 2016, we selected 25 projects in the consolidated RFP. In 2017, 25 again. In 2018, it was 27. In 2019, it was 39. 2020, it was 34. Big increases both of those years. Also important to note, for all the resources that we are able to consolidate in the consolidated RFP, it's actually not the only RFP that Minnesota Housing does for capital resources. There are a few programs that actually just don't fit. Uh, notably, the Public Housing uh, Preservation Program, the Rental Rehab Deferred Loan Program, and the Workforce Housing Development Program. And back in 2020, before we could have foresaw the challenges that would come with COVID-19, we selected another 60 projects in those three programs on top of the consolidated RFP. It was really exciting. It was a busy year. Uh, it became even busier after that. Uh, and then the COVID-19 pandemic hit, throwing so much into disarray. Uh, construction cost changes, which I imagine a number of people out there going, oh my gosh, the construction cost changes. But then supply chain issues, operating costs, interest rates, gaps, gaps, gap and gaps again on any number of projects but then also staffing challenges across the board i know we felt that here at minnesota housing uh, trying to retain and fill positions but it really was an industry-wide musical chairs during the pandemic and continuing afterwards i know i was in a number of meetings trying to remember who was with which organization at that point on various projects but what does that all mean and i think uh, we can all feel it in the time and the cost I imagine, again, many of you out there, even though I can't see you are nodding your heads, feeling the time and the cost impacts. Even the projects that we would have thought of as easy felt hard, and let's be honest, it didn't just feel hard, they actually were hard. So let's go to 2021 and 2022, getting past uh, those first two years. Uh, it was a big change. Uh, there were no significant new state or federal resources. And in fact, the 9% housing tax credit had a decrease because there was a temporary bump at the federal level that expired during that time period. Uh, no significant new HIV authorizations and continued, if not worse, market volatility with construction costs continuing to move faster than any of us uh, could respond uh, really faster than, than what we could have imagined, I think, a few years ago. Then interest rates uh, becoming a real headline and back to the theme of gaps even further. But all that culminated in the consolidated RFP selections in 2021, it dropped to 20, 20 projects from the 30s in the years before that. And then the more recent 2022 consolidated RFP selections, it was 17. 
And it was not for lack of really good applications that came in. And I know this Minnesota housing team wanted to select more, but it also represents both the market changes that were out there, the construction cost changes, and the power of housing infrastructure bonds and the state appropriations that we uh, usually receive for Minnesota housing. There was, uh, shall we say, hiccup the last couple of years uh, in some of those processes. So what does that solve mean now and where are we at? Well, it's still a little bit looking back. So funding modifications. So a funding modification, for those of you that aren't familiar, is what happens at Minnesota Housing after a project is selected but experiences a gap and needs additional assistance. And in 2019 and 2020, 60% of the projects received a funding modification after selection. 60%, more than double than what we had seen on a percentage basis in previous years. And in reality, it was even more than that because that excludes the projects that only get 9% housing tax credits and might have received additional credits in the round two uh, or it had carryover. The 2021 consolidated RFP selections, 75% of the projects had a funding modification. Now, 2022 is too early to know since those projects were just selected in January, but I know we're already tracking a number of gaps. We all know that gaps are painful. Nobody likes them, nobody wants to have to address them, but we have collectively with the development partners and uh, with uh, many local governments and other uh, entities providing funding. And in fact, for all of those projects with all of those funding gaps, not a single project was canceled by Minnesota Housing. We worked with every single one of the funding modifications. Now, I can't hear everyone, but I would venture to guess some of the people listening are thinking, but it wasn't as much as what I'd hoped for or as much as what I needed or as much as I would have liked to have for a project. And it doesn't mean that Minnesota Housing is always in a position to fill 100% of the requested amount, but it is a representation of the importance that when a project is selected of what we collectively do, and I emphasize collectively, it's both here at the team at Minnesota Housing, with the communities, with the development partners, with supportive service providers and fund other funders and syndicators of trying to get these projects over the finish line. But we also recognize that when there's funding modifications, then that adds time. It goes to a project and that becomes our enemy, right? Because we had all those market changes that were leading to funding modifications. And then the funding modification itself takes time. And it's something that we all work really hard and have been looking at our processes and how we can best address those. Uh, now, many of you may know, uh, or maybe you purposely forgot uh, that I was a developer for a number of years before coming to Minnesota Housing. And I know I'm not alone in that. We have a number of uh, people that have worked in the development industry in various ways here at Minnesota Housing. And I, really we, feel and internalize uh, the need to close and the time pressures that go along with that. It might be one of those spots where there's universal agreement that every single person would love to see things close faster. In contrary to what it may have felt like on some projects, indeed, closings never stopped uh, during the pandemic. Uh, and looking back on the data, uh, the multifamily team closed more loans in, 2020, 20, in 2022 than in any year since at least 2012. And it may have been longer, but that's as far as my data go back. So more loans in 2022 were closed from consolidated RFP selections than in any year since at least 2022. Now, there are a handful of projects that get more than one loan. Uh, so if we just look at just projects specifically, it still was more projects that closed from consolidated RFP selections in 2022 than in any year since at least 2015, and that year was a tie with 2022. So you might be thinking, uh, and really, I, I mean the, uh, the other listeners out there, but not my project. Where was my project? It needed to close as well, and it wish have been faster. And there were certainly some uh, outliers and some other projects that had complexities. So the complexities that I know that projects were dealing with uh, was the expiration of the state historic tax credit, which affected a number of projects. Uh, and we are looking to hopefully, crossing my fingers, is reinstated this year. There was restructuring with some of our federal partners that added time, notably USDA Rural Development for projects that were connected to that. And probably more unique circumstances with some projects than what we'd have time to list today. But, uh, you know, still the feeling that it took more time to close. And in fact, the 2019 and 2020 selections did. It hit up, up against the pandemic. People trying to refigure out a number of these processes and then all those market changes that I referenced. So if it felt like it took longer to close, the data supports that. It did take longer to close. And, and again, some of you out there are probably thinking, well, duh, I know, I had that project. It took longer to close. 
but it wasn't all of them. It was not universal. Uh, and in fact, now when we look at the projects closing in late 2022 and 2023, we are getting back to what I'm going to call more typical timeframes uh, for closings. Uh, thankfully, we've seen some of that market volatility settle out and some of the processes improve during that time period. The other aspect of it is with decreased number of selections the last two years, I'm going to say that we are effectively caught up. Not on every single project, not exactly where everyone would always like to have it, but we're in a very different position as an industry, not just at Minnesota Housing, than we were a couple of years ago. So now looking ahead and connecting to where Commissioner House started us off uh, is the legislative proposals, which are extremely exciting. We really want to increase the number of projects selected. We know how much work and cost that goes into submitting those applications. Uh, it's one of the reasons that uh, we work so hard on this latest uh, qualified allocation plan with the supportive housing team on how can we rethink some of the processes and information that are needed for applications. And we think there's more opportunity to rethink other areas in the future. Um, at the legislature, we are eagerly awaiting the actual outcome of what the funding resources and will the legislature include any other policy or use changes. Uh, we're tracking it as close as I imagine many of our partners out there are. So where do we look at now? Uh, well, from a staffing perspective at Minnesota Housing, uh, we are already in the process of adding a number of positions in anticipation of a very positive legislative outcome. Now, creating the positions and getting them filled, I think just universally, we know are two separate things, but we already have those processes underway on a number of fronts uh, because we do want to add more capacity in those spaces. We're also looking at a number of processes, what can be streamlined or removed, better understood uh, in a number of different areas. We're working with a couple different partners out there to evaluate a number of our systems and the way that work is handled and how we can help developers in the due diligence process, in the post-selection process on the information needs. So there's more work to do in that area and we acknowledge that and we are pursuing that both as a combination of process improvements and staffing additions here at Minnesota Housing. I also wanna recognize that many of our partners out there are in very similar positions trying to fill almost the same types of positions that we are trying to fill here at Minnesota Housing so that we can collectively do this work as quickly and as efficiently as possible to add more housing really across Minnesota. Every part of the state needs housing of some type Almost every part of the state needs supportive housing of some type. Uh, and we are looking forward to that legislative outcome and the selections that will happen later this year to get more housing built and preserved in Minnesota. So I just wanted to do that little time machine trip because it's sometimes hard for us to collectively reflect back, especially when things have been particularly hard, but also a recognition of the progress that has been made. And we here at Minnesota Housing, we see across the projects, and that's not always as clear out there. So that's why I wanted to share some of that background data on the number of closings uh, and the improvements that have happened over the last couple of years. And the work that we want to continue to do internally and externally with our many partners, which is how we get this work done. So with that, uh, thank you everyone for your participation today. I have no doubt there are more questions out there than what is actually uh, was able to come up today. Anne Heitlinger is our technical assistance guru and can connect people in any number of different areas to answer more specific project questions than what was able to come up today. Uh, and thank you. Thank you to the internal team here at Minnesota Housing and for everyone else out there that puts so much heart and soul into these projects. We see it, we know it, um, and we are thankful for it. So have a good rest of your day. We look forward to connecting uh, through application submission and well afterwards.